We're reading a book by J.H. Merle d'Aubigné, The Famous History of the Reformation of the 16th Century. The book is entitled Germany, England and Scotland. Uh, we've been in Scotland for some time. This book was um, mainly put together in 1847, following d'Aubigné's trip to uh, Scotland in 1845. And this came just uh, four years after the uh, famous disruption of the Church of Scotland, forming the Free Church of Scotland in 1843. A tumultuous and fascinating time in church history, one from which we can learn a lot. We also, um, we also were considering how in the ten years leading up to the disruption uh, there was a tremendous revival um, and many people converted and coming back to the Lord Jesus Christ because of the intensity of the struggle. And uh, we also were aware that uh, the reason for the struggle was because the English Parliament had passed a law reinstalling patronage in Scotland, whereby um, patrons, or often landowners, or in many cases the Crown, could inflict unbelieving moderate ministers on congregations who were hungry for Bible teaching and gospel preaching. Uh, and um, even if all the heads of households in a region or in a parish objected to the um, imposition of the minister, the minister was still imposed. Well, the General Assembly then uh, of the Church of Scotland then passed its own law saying that the men could be vetoed, the ministers could be vetoed by the heads of households uh, and the moderate party in the Church of Scotland then went to the uh, Court of Session, I think it was in Edinburgh, and the state then intervened to enforce or to force the ministers on the congregations being a, a watershed in a church history whereby the church whereby the state was now intervening in the affairs of the church and effectively running the church and behind this was an attempt to bring back um, episcopacy uh, and behind episcopacy was always popery so even in the um, 19th century we had this great struggle uh, against um, this uh, patronage and it was so important to the people that they had Bible teaching ministers that they fought tooth and nail. <laughs> We're going to read more about this now. So this chapter is entitled The Third Reformation. While these events were passing, the church and the general assembly which represented her remained firmly attached to the principles of her fathers. At the meeting of assembly in 1838, the decisions of the civil courts were laid before them. The ministers and elders who had repaired to their posts were all fully sensible of the importance of the crisis. It now remains to be seen, said they, whether the civil courts are the rulers of the church or the ministers and elders to whom Christ, according to our confession, has entrusted its government. Shall we be less free than the bishops of the English church of whom no one dares to ask an account of their reasons for refusing to ordain any presenter? We will give up all, our churches, our manses, our globes, our stipends. They had to in the end. Rather than acknowledge the encroachments by which a worldly power intends to trample underfoot the inheritance of our fathers. So spoke these noble Scotchmen. A minister of Glasgow, Dr Buchanan, proposed the following resolution. The General Assembly, while they unqualifiedly acknowledged the exclusive jurisdiction of the civil courts in regard to the civil rights and emoluments secured by law to the Church, and will, it has been called in Scotland, the March, okay, yeah, ever give and inculcate implicit obedience to their decisions in such matters, so they acknowledge the civil authority in civil matters. Do resolve that, as is declared in the confession of faith of this national established church, the Lord Jesus Christ, as King and Head of the Church, hath therein appointed a government in the hand of church officers distinct from the civil magistrate, and that in all matters touching the doctrine, government and discipline of the church, her judica judicatories possess an exclusive jurisdiction founded on the word of God, which power ecclesiastical flows immediately from God and the mediator and its spiritual, not having a temporal head on earth, but only Christ, the only spiritual king and governor of his church. And they do further resolve that this spiritual jurisdiction and the sole headship of the Lord Jesus Christ, on which it depends, 
they will assert and at all hazards defend by the help and blessing of God. Thus Scotland beheld the fulfilment of this promise. He shall turn the heart of the children to their fathers. Malachi 4 verse 6. And the church, again taking her stand upon that ancient rock, once defended by her martyrs, prepared to await with faith and courage the shock of the winds, the floods and the tempest. This resolution only passed by a majority of 41. The national enthusiasm in this serious struggle was still increasing. I mean, I was reading the book, The Annals of the Disruption, and um, ministers were creeping around Scotland in disguise in order to preach, because if they got caught, they would be um, effectively um, uh, put out of the ministry. Um, so people would invite them, and they would come in the quiet of night, and they would be disguised, and nobody would um, recognise them on the road. Uh, and then they would show up and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. But it was a really... It was um, the, the, the struggle was intense and many people suffered the loss of their livelihood as a result of this struggle, especially at the time of the disruption, because they loved the Lord Jesus Christ and they put him first. For example, I, I was living in Aberdeen when I read the book The Annals of Disruption uh, and I was living in a place called Woodside and I was reading about the mills of Woodside, the cotton mills of Woodside, where down by the River Don, um, and where the mill girls came out with the Free Church of Scotland because they loved the Lord Jesus Christ, and they suffered tremendous persecution because of their adherence to the gospel. Nothing quite right like reading an, uh, um, a serious Christian history book where at the place where the events described it happened. Anyway, the national enthusiasm in this serious struggle was still increasing. The people both in towns and in the country, especially in the highlands, were zealous for the cause of independence, but most of the nobility were in favour of patronage. The Marquis of Breedlebane was then almost alone in following the generous footsteps of the ancient earls of London and Sutherland, petitions signed by 260,000 of the most pious of Scotland's sons, demanded the maintenance of the constitution of the Church of their fathers. Few were indifferent. All were either for or against it, and the ferment was general. Well, I'd like to recommend um, a uh, reading from the book Annals of the Disruption, which I put up on Sermon Audio. It's entitled, When the Church Has to Meet in the Open Air, and it's fascinating. When the Church Has to Meet in the Open Air, on Sermon Audio. The moderate party then displayed a decision which they had never shown since the time of Robertson. They thought last meeting, which was to terminate the existence of evangelical predominance in the National Church of Scotland, and move that the declaration be adopted. It is no question, said he, with that noble and powerful eloquence which characterises him. It is no mere question of individual or party wrangling, but a great constitutional question concerning the respective jurisdictions of two distinct and yet coordinate powers, each of them independent and supreme within its own sphere. With what formidable evils are we not inevitably threatened? If the Parliament allows the civil courts to persist in their encroachments on the constitutional jurisdictions of the Church, and to grant orders in spiritual matters which conscience is compelled to reject, and to employ the argument of physical force as if violence was to be set up in the place of right, such arguments have been already employed, continued the orator, but they may be taken up by men who have the strength of millions of the ungodly and sinners upon their side, and poured forth in some widespread war of turbulence and disorder over the face of our commonwealth. Chalmers well knew that when once religious liberty is trampled underfoot, all other liberties are endangered. The motion was adopted by a majority of 131, and the moderator delivered to the Lord High Commissioner, the respected Marquis of Butte, the Church's claim of rights, requesting him to present it to Her Majesty. As Queen Victoria, a separate address was also presented to Queen Victoria, praying her to take measures towards the abolition of patronage. The Assembly of 1842 thus commenced in Scotland the Third Reformation. I will here mention a circumstance of trifling importance, but which may be considered as an example of that decision of character to be found in Scotland 
which may perhaps be sought for in vain elsewhere. A minister deposed by the assembly, being in possession of the parish church of Rhyme, or I think that's Rimi, um, on the morning of the 13th of June, the whole people of the place assembled before daybreak at a spot which a generous Christian had given them, whereon to build another church. The opposite party had threatened them with an interdict, which, if produced the next day, or even that evening, might have prevented them from building their church. The permission of the General Assembly for the erection of the chapel had just arrived. All immediately set to work. The masons, builders, and carpenters of Solomon and Hiram, 1 Kings 5, never displayed such activity on Mount Zion as that little band of poor and obscure Scottish Christians in erecting their humble chapel. Can a church be built in a day? They had already prepared timber and quarried stone from the neighbouring mountains. Labourers, masons and carpenters worked with willing hands, and thanks to their vigorous efforts, before the evening of the same day, a spacious and commodious edifice was ready to receive the worshippers of the living God. A church was built in one day, because there was going to be a, a, um, something, uh, 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 some kind of legal document the following day read out, which stopped them from building it. Praise God for that. And that just, that just shows you the determination in the Scottish people at that time. This was a symbol. When God's own time should arrive, the free church of Scotland, raised by the faith of a whole people, shall we say born out of fire, would also be set up in a day. Behold the day, behold it is come, Ezekiel 7 verse 10. All indeed now tended towards this. On the first week of July, in the mountains, valleys, villages and towns of Scotland, crowded meetings were held in different places. Clear and eloquent addresses enlightened the public mind upon the principles which the General Assembly had recently professed. Men's consciences were convinced, and enthusiastic applause manifested the adherence of the people. There was a great excitement in Scotland, an excitement of a legitimate character, which, far from infringing the laws, claimed as a right the execution of the most solemn treaties, struggles of the church and state. <clears throat> An important event now responded mournfully to this national movement and hurried the church towards her complete enfranchisement. The House of Lords was to pronounce a final decision between the civil courts and the General Assembly. The anxious looks of Scotland were fixed upon the proceedings of this tribunal. So England was deciding Scotland's fate. There was little hope. I think that's how it was. On the one hand, how was it to be expected that a court, with the majority of which was composed of English and Irish lords, should comprehend a Scottish question, which seemed difficult even to many of the Scots themselves? Yet on the other hand, might it not be hoped that these powerful lords, whose judgments ought to be formed on so elevated a standard, would rise above those clouds which obscure the sight of men who look from below? Would not this High Court remember the illegal act passed by its predecessors in 1712 and endeavour to make amends for it? It was not the case of March and Strathbogie, but that of Ochterada and Mr Young, which was then brought before the House of Lords. The pre he was a man inflicted on the congregation despite a huge opposition uh, inflicted by the patron. The presbytery, the majority of which was composed of evangelical ministers and elders, had refused to ordain Mr. ordain Mr Young, who was objected to by almost all the communicants of the parish. But that church had, at the same time, awarded the fruits of the benefice to the Lord Patron. Nevertheless, Mr Young brought an action for damages against the ministers and elders of the presbytery for having refused him, notwithstanding the decision of the civil courts, that ordination of which... The word of God says, lay hands suddenly on no man. Imagine taking somebody to court because they won't ordain you. Absurd. First Timothy 5.22 The House of Lords, and especially the Lord Chancellor and Lord Broom, whose opinions were changed in regard to the veto, decided that for refusing to perform an act which should be the most unrestrained of any that can exist, the consecration of a minister to the service of God, the presbytery might be liable to an action for damages. On hearing this strange decision, so I'm a minister and I say I'm not going to ordain that man because he's not a godly man. 
And the courts say, right, that's it. You either ordain him or you face damages. On hearing this strange decision, the friends of the independence of the church were filled with consternation. What, said they, an assembly of ministers and elders may be condemned for refusing to perform a purely spiritual act and may be fined for obeying the dictates of their conscience. Plus Hashem's plus M shows the more things change, the more they stay the same. All ecclesiastical government and discipline are thus at once laid prostrate. Nay, there can be no longer any ecclesiastical courts, for the very essence of a court is its liberty to decide according to its own convictions. From that moment it became evident to every sound judgment that the Church of Scotland must break off all connection with the state. Nothing now remains for us, said they, but to protest against these unconstitutional invasions, and to retire, leaving to him who is the prince of the kings of the earth to vindicate his cause in his own time. They must now be prepared for the event. The Lord was coming in his mighty power. His angel was to visit every manse and every house in Scotland, so that there should be a great cry throughout the land. It was not in the still small voice that the Lord was to be heard, but in a great and strong wind that rent the mountains. 1 Kings 19 verse 11 Scotland was to prepare to meet her God, Amos 4 verse 12. In the month of October, 32 of the oldest ministers of this noble church sent an address to those ministers who took the deepest interest in her liberties, inviting them to meet at Edinburgh on the 17th of November. A spirit of prayer and supplication was diffused throughout Scotland. Never, perhaps, had there been in the country of John Welsh that man of prayer, such fervent and general devotion as during the week preceding the convocation. Not only, it was said, are the liberties of the church at stake, but the very existence of evangelical religion. Therefore, when these ministers had left their parishes, their flocks still continued their meetings for prayer. Even in the country villages, venerable patriarchs were to be found, who, remembering what, that Christ has made his people a nation of priests, called publicly on the name of the Lord. The whole multitude of the people were praying, Luke 1, 12, crying with a loud and bitter cry. The convocation met on the morning of the 17th of December in St. George's Church, where Dr. Chalmers preached on these impressive words. Unto the upright there arise light in darkness. You know, if there was one place you would have liked to have been in the 1970s, 19th, 19th century, not the 1970s, that's different. In the 19th century, it would have been at this meeting in this church when Dr. Chalmers was preaching. That was a stupendous event in church history, the birth of the Free Church of Scotland. On the evening of the same day, the deliberations, all also presided over by Chalmers, commenced in another church. About 500 ministers were present. All agreed in acknowledging that the decisions of the civil courts were subversive of the constitution of the church and would shortly lead to its destruction, so they could see that it wasn't a small issue, it was a life and death issue for the church, unless a remedy could be found to prevent so great an evil. But what was the remedy to be? And this opinions were divided some considering that the British Constitution had guaranteed the independence of the Church, were desirous that this Constitution should be defended, and that the Church should retain her position as an establishment until the State should be compelled to change its policy by the just indignation of the people. But the leaders of the movement, Chalmers, Candlish and Cunningham, showed that this course would confound civil and spiritual duties, that the Church was not answerable for the integrity of the civil constitution, and consequently could not take upon herself to defend it, and that by doing so she would infallibly produce collisions, tumults, and perhaps even revolutions, renouncing therefore those political means of resistance which had signalised the Scotland of former ages, these Christian men demanded that the Church should decide upon maintaining her own independence, and if necessary, for that purpose, should relinquish her union with the state and all the temporal advantages the pastors received from government. The convocation, which opened on the 17th of November, was not concluded till the 24th. Several ministers had been obliged to return to their homes before the end of the meetings. Nevertheless, 350 pastors 
signed the resolutions. These seven days of convocation were a season of great spiritual refreshing, a remarkable unity, a continued spirit of faith and of prayer characterized this assembly. God was with them. What a, what a, what a glorious picture of, of God working in his people. All felt that their heavenly king, according to his promise, was truly in the midst of them. Besides the resolutions, the convocation agreed upon a memorial to the government and, addre and an address to the people of Scotland. This address was soon sent from Edinburgh into every parish, and never perhaps has a more solemn appeal been laid before a nation. The former struggles which we have recounted with the testimonies of Knox, Melville, Welsh, Erskine, and of so many more confessors were eloquently recalled Recalled, the Church of Scotland, said these ministers, has been honoured to contend not more for the doctrine of the Redeemer's cross than for the honour of his crown, and this constitutes her peculiar distinction amongst the churches of the Reformation. That's true, down through the centuries the Scottish um, Church had been called to, to contend again and again for the uh, headship and the crown of Christ Jesus, the, the Lord Jesus Christ, Christ's crown and covenant. These words contain an important truth. What are the passages in your national history, they afterwards continue, which you read with the most thrilling interest, and which you would wish to be engraven on the minds of your children? What are the scenes in your land of mountain and flood, on which you gaze with feelings too deep for utterance? Are they not the passages which record the faithful con con contendings of your forefathers for a pure gospel and a free church are they not the scenes where many of them lie buried as martyrs in the cause of civil and religious freedom they won by their blood the privileges which you are called to maintain by your efforts and prayers and would you willingly have it said by posterity that you relinquished without a struggle the birthright of your children or that in the calm and sunshine of outward prosperity you suffered that noble vessel to go down, which was reared in the tempest and rocked by the hurricane. Think of the covenanting era. Thus did the ministers of the convocation address their people. What Scottish heart could remain unmoved? Yet though the House of Lords had decided, the voice of the government still remained to be heard. Would it not weigh more justly the great constitutional rights on which they were to decide? It happened otherwise. The government, after receiving the memorial of the last commission, returned to an answer which annihilated all the hopes of the church. An answer polite, most certainly through imprudent, though imprudent, in which combining what the commission had purposely kept separate. Now, just thinking about during this COVID crisis and churches being closed, and some men stood up and said, the state doesn't have the right to close the churches. That is God's right alone. The claim of rights regarding the spiritual independence of the Church as guaranteed by the Constitution and the Address Concerning Patronage, the British Minister declared that he was obliged to reject both petitions in order to defend, defend the privileges of the patrons. At the same time he accused the Church of attacking the rights of the State, whereas the General Assembly was justly conscious of having triumphantly refuted so unfound an accusation. Perhaps, however, this misunderstanding of the government might have been expected. The English ministry, accustomed to the forms of the Episcopal Church, in which the flocks have no voice, influenced by the speeches of the Scottish nobles and patrons, who were both judges and parties in the cause, and finding as much difficulty in putting themselves in the place of those beyond the Tweed as of those beyond St George's Channel, could scarcely avoid mistakes. Besides this, the Crown, ever since the Act of Queen Anne, had set far too high a value upon the right of nominating the ministers of more than 300 parishes, and could not understand that to secure the attachment of a people like the Scotch, it would be much the better way to allow them a share in church matters, and thus encourage the development of Christianity, than by reserving the right of appointing to a benefice some insignificant person, recommended by a noble lord. The adversaries of the Scottish movement likewise represented it in London as an affair of little importance, but it caused a constitutional crisis in the end. 
for the sake of which it was not worthwhile to sacrifice advantages they valued so highly. All this may explain how such a distinguished statesman as Sir James Graham could commit so great a fault. It is the greatest with which the Peel ministry can be reproached, but it is at the same time one of those of which the victim may say, Ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good. Genesis 1.20 According to the English ministry, and this is even yet the judgment of many good men in England, the Church, having infringed the law by the Veto Act, the encroachments of the civil courts that ensued, was simply a necessary and a natural reaction against the usurpations of the Church. Here, in fact, lay the difficulty of the affair, and with some little intelligence which certainly was not wanting, and a little patience, it might have been easily unravelled but it appears that instead of taking the trouble to untie the knot, the government preferred having recourse to the sword of Alexander. Even supposing the veto to be an act opposed to the constitution of the United Kingdom, which we do not think it was, the English government might have declined to recognise it, or might have demanded some modification. The Church had declared her willingness to do so, and had stated this in her address to the people of Scotland. The government might even have required the withdrawal of the Act. Many of the most eminent men of the Church would have agreed to do so in a spirit of conciliation at the same time, without sacrificing the principle itself. Yet while acting in this manner towards the Church, the government should at the same time have declared that the Court of Session, first by inducing the ministers to continue their functions after having been suspended or deprived by the highest authority of the Church, and secondly by forbidding an ecclesiastical court, under pain of civil punishments, to lay hands on certain probationers, had done what no Scottish tribunal had ever been or could ever be allowed to do. By thus tolerating such usurpations in the civil courts and throwing all the blame on the Church and none on the Court of Session, the government exhibited a partiality much to be regretted and really made use of two weights and two measures, giving Scotland reason to fear that they had determined upon the destruction of those spiritual rights for which their fathers had striven for so many centuries and that the final aim of the Cabinet of St. James's was to overthrow the independence of the Church of Scotland and bury it forever in the crypts of the Home Office. I'm not sure they seem to be doing that today with the Church as well. Or at least some of us feel that. The Commission of the General Assembly again met. At the same time, decided upon an answer to the Government and a petition to the House of Commons, the only one of the three powers which had not yet declared itself, in a most eloquent speech, Chalmers asserted that the evangelical body must inevitably be driven from the establishment and should consequently prepare without delay for this serious event. Come when it may, said he, Scotland must not be taken by surprise and laid helpless and hopeless at the feet of her enemies. Scotland must become an experimental garden covered with churches and with schools. I mean, that's some vision, but the ten years... Um before this, the um, all the support for it, um, all the support for it came about. If you read Annals of Disruption, you hear about how they built so many churches and the struggles and difficulties they had. Even the setting up of, a, of the Iron Church, which was floating um, on a barge in one of the locks. This appeal of the venerable patriarch of Scotland, as well responded to. Numerous meetings of elders in concert with the evangelical ministers founded a provisional committee to provide for the approaching crisis. Everything was prepared for the support of the pastors and the erection of churches, and deputations were sent throughout the country, commissioned to explain to the people the great principles for the defence of which the bark of the church was about to launch into a dangerous sea and to sustain the terrible collision of the vessel of the state. The response of the people was instantaneous, and the deputations were everywhere enthusiastically welcomed. The martyr spirit is yet alive in Scotland, said the deputies on their return. Scotland's heart is still as sound as ever. Maybe never sounder. Associations formed all over the kingdom entered into correspondence with the Provisional Committee at Edinburgh. This committee issued weekly communications, copies of which were sent to the Provisional Associations to the number of 150,000. This mighty activity is one of the finest features of the Scottish character. 
The House of Commons had not yet decided, and the cause of Scottish liberty was to find within its walls several zealous and eloquent defenders. The son of one of the Scottish peers, the Honourable Fox Maud, now Secretary at War, that's 1847, having presented to the House the petition of the Commission, clearly stated the question of the 7th of the March, and the motion was eloquently defended by Mr Rutherford, Mr P.M. Stewart, Mr Campbell of Moneys, an English member who has now, has now succeeded Sir James Graham in the Home Department. Sir George Grey supported it with generosity and calmness, but it was opposed by Sir James Graham and Sir Robert Peel. Of the Scottish members of the House, there were 25 for the motion and only 12 against it. Scotland was thus in favour of the liberties of the Presbyterian Church, but the English and Irish formed a majority who voted in a contrary direction. The motion was rejected by 211 against 76. A lot of those were bishops from the Church of England, weren't they? So voted... No, that's, sorry, that's the House of Commons, not the House of Lords. So voted the House of Commons. All was now over. The three powers had decided. All human tribunals had now closed their ears against the complaint of the Church. Everything seemed to say to her, like the prophet, Set thy house in order, for thou shalt die. Isaiah 38. But there remained a refuge for the people of God within her. There remained for them an appeal to the heavenly tribunal, to the judgment seat of him who skillet and mark it alive, who bring her down to the grave and bring her up. 1 Samuel 2, 6. I think that's Scots. From this time all hearts were raised to heaven, and all eyes were turned to the General Assembly, which was to meet in the month of May, and the Government Party made every effort in order that members favourable to the decisions of the civil courts should form a majority in it. The motive of such endeavours is evident. If the Evangelical Party should be stronger in the Assembly, the Church would then, by the decision of her highest authority, formally renounce her union with the State, and the Moderates would be obliged to create a new Church, which they wished all means to avoid. The party opposed to ecclesiastical independence obtained their desired object, not, however, it would appear, without some illegal encroachments. There were also a few ministers who, when the time of trial came, were offended. When the trumpet called to battle, the courage of several cooled and their hearts turned aside from the conflict. OK, we're going to leave that there. The next chapter is a disruption. I mean, this is thrilling church history because these people had to contend for the faith. They had to do what they did in order to honour the Lord Jesus Christ, and yet God gave them such a, an outpouring of his spirit and such a, a powerful um, evangelical gospel-centred um, focus. Uh, this was a mighty revival that took place in Scotland. Now, I seem to have um, got confused there with which meeting it was with Thomas Chalmers. That must have been the 1842 meeting assembly. Um, the disruption was at the 1843 assembly, and we're going to read about that next. We're reading the book Germany, England and Scotland by uh, J.H. Merle de Bigny, a Swiss minister who was converted under the teaching of Robert Haldane, a Scottish nobleman um, in Geneva. Uh, and we've come to the disruption of the Church of Scotland in 1843. Uh, this is a glorious episode in Scottish church history. Um, it, the, it was a result of patronage. It was a result of the uh, encro in, 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 encroachment upon the church and the church government by uh, secular courts. Uh, and uh, as we read in the last chapter, or as we heard in the last chapter, uh, most especially the um, uh, now the uh, House of Commons and House of Lords in England, so that uh, so that English politicians were deciding, uh, and even English bishops were deciding um, what should happen in the Scottish Church, and their decision was that the uh, Church should be uh, submit to the law of the land and should do what she was told, i.e. patronage, which was a great offence to people who longed for evangelical ministers to teach them the word of God and declare the gospel to them. Now, uh, I have this uh, a book which I might well serialise in future called The Annals of the Disruption, and it shows that there was not only was a tremendous number of people in Scotland at that time who left the Church of Scotland to form new churches, but they had a tremendous struggle, both in the ten years leading up to the disruption 
and also in the time after when they had to um, build new churches and very often they were severely persecuted. Many, um, for example, who worked on estates in Scotland um, lost their jobs and lost their livelihoods, for example. So this was by no means a sacrifice or a cause or a struggle without victims, without persecution and without su suffering. And yet it was a glorious outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So let's read and study and think about the disruption of 1843. Now, I said last time, but I meant this, that if there was one meeting in the 19th century that I would like to have attended, it would have been this meeting when Thomas Chalmers led the newly formed Free Church of Scotland out of the Assembly of the Church of Scotland. So, Chapter 7, The Disruption. A great dilemma was now set before the ministers and members of the Church of Scotland. Should the church sink at once into a mere secular institution, the creature and servant of the state, or should she retain her God-given principles in all their holy and free integrity and resign that position and those emoluments which could no longer be retained without dishonour? It was thought by many worldly people that most of those who had spoken so loudly for the independence of the church would fail at the last moment. The hour was approaching when the question would be resolved. On Monday the 15th of May, only three days before the opening of the Assembly, a great number of ministers and elders repaired to Edinburgh to consult upon their final measures. Lord Aberdeen had endeavoured to avert the coming storm by proposals against which Dr Gordon and Mr Campbell of Moneys a member of Parliament declared themselves in the preparatory meeting with much seriousness and energy. It was finally settled that as soon as the General <coughs> Assembly should meet, the evangelical body should protest. And then retire to form themselves into a distinct assembly Mr Dunlap was entrusted with the drawing up of the protest. Thus these our evangelical Christians of Scotland prepared to do what had been done 314 years before by their illustrious predecessors in the famous Diet of Spire. That's when the word Protestant came about and uh, what happened in the Diet of um, Spire. Um, I think he's going to tell us actually, so I'll just read on. Um, new Protestants were to show themselves in the church and take their place in history, though on a less elevated platform. Beside the Elector of Saxony, the Landgrave of Hesse, the Deputy Sturm and the Prince of Anhalt, the thing that hath been it is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done, and there is no new thing under the sun, Ecclesiastes 1.9. Okay, so what happened at the Diet of Spire was that some German princes who had supported the Reformation and understood the truth met um, with um, a much larger group of um, Catholic princes, this is how I understand it, and they were told that they were allowed to continue being Protestants, no, allowed to continue with the doctrines of the Reformation, they were only called Protestants afterwards. They were allowed to continue with the doctrines of the Reformation, but they were not allowed to preach the Gospel or to spread the Word of God. Thereby that would have ensured that they would have become extinct. And they were told that if they did not do that, then they would face the full military force of the Catholic um, armies. Now, of course, they could not uh, hope in any sense to have a military victory over the Catholic armies. But they said um, before the Diet of Spires that they protest. And so they became Protestants. They were known as Protestants because they protested. They protested because of the authority of God's word, which they put in the place of the authority of the Pope and his councils. So they refused to bow to the military pressure that was put on them to abandon the Reformation. And they maintained the authority of the word of God and they became known as Protestants. We protest. Now, that still left them with the problem that they were about to be annihilated militarily uh, by the Catholic armies. But that didn't happen there was an invasion from the east by Islamic forces and all of those armies that were due to annihilate them had to go off and fight in the east against a different force. Um, so God delivered them. But that's where the origin of the word Protestant came from. And what Dorbigny is saying here is that 
here is another stand for the truth. Here is another refusing to bow the knee to um, whatever um, authority is setting itself up in the place of God's word and God's truth. Uh, and a similar stand is taking place. The 18th of May arrived. A bright sun was shining in the generally cloudy sky of Scotland and announced a lovely day of spring. The great and the noble magistrates and ministers, elders and humble Christians, men and women, drawn together by some, some by fervent love for the church of their fathers, and others by mere curiosity, thronged into animated crowds the streets of the ancient capital, Edinburgh. Holyrood, where all the year a dreary silence and a majestic void prevail, opened its gates, its courts, its antechambers and its royal saloons. At last the Lord High Commissioner of Her Majesty came forth with great pomp and advanced it sounds like King Agrippa in Acts and advanced slowly at the head of a long procession to the Cathedral of St Giles. There Dr Welsh, the moderator of the preceding assembly, delivered an eloquent discourse on that text so full of meaning, let everyone be fully persuaded in his own mind. Romans 14, verse 5. The service over, the Lord High Commissioner and all his suite again entered the royal carriages and all proceeded towards St. Andrew's Church, where the General Assembly was to sit. The grandest spectacle that ever Scotland beheld was now preparing. The church was... To, I'm going to um, put this on YouTube, I think, and I'll put up the picture, um, painted uh, the contemporary picture of all the participants in the disruption. Um, on the thumbnail. The grandest spectacle that ever Scotland beheld was now preparing. The church was to take leave of the state. The two societies were to give each other the bill of divorcement. The multitude everywhere eager after, after excitement, but which then in Edinburgh was in a great measure agitated by the noblest feelings, crowded and jostled each other in the streets between the two churches of St Giles and St Andrews. A considerable body of policemen could with difficulty open a passage through the crowd for the Queen's representative. At length the brilliant procession passed along, and then those sons of Scotland, who had looked with almost an indifferent eye upon this splendour, were thrilled on beholding the humble representatives of the oppressed church, advancing on foot, reminds me of Luther going into the Diet of Worms, Anxious yet grave and determined, preparing to bear testimony before the great ones of the nation, and as it were in the presence of the whole Church of Christ, this frail bark, which continued a few poor but faithful, which contained a few but poor but faithful disciples, but where Christ was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow, Mark four verse thirty eight, moved onward through the multitude, and the agitated waves, having opened for its passage immediately closed behind it. From an early hour in the morning, the galleries of St Andrew's Church were filled with a crowd of spectators who had passed many weary hours in expectation. Suddenly a noise and bustle without announced that the moment was at hand. The measured tramp of slowly advancing steeds, the sounds of martial music, the cheers of the people, heralded the arrival of the Queen's representative. He entered and took his seat on the throne, surrounded by his pages and officers. The members of assembly entered after him and took their places in the body of the church, some on the right hand, others on the left. On the evangelical side there was serious looks, grave faces, and that awed and solemn countenance which characterises men engaged in a sacred and perilous work. On the side of the moderates, an embarrassed and foreboding look was to be observed, with the consciousness that the victory now to be won would prove, in reality, a great defeat to the church. The moderator, David Welsh, whom God has now taken to his heavenly home, opened the meeting with a fervent prayer. Then a pause ensued. No one spoke. No one stirred. All was silent and motionless. Thousands of anxious hearts were waiting in expectation, and every man seemed to hold his breath, as in fear of losing one of the words that were now to be uttered in this sacred place, and to decide the destiny of the Church of God. The moderator then took up the protest which had been prepared, and gravely pronounced the following words amidst the most profound and solemn silence. 
According to the usual form of procedure, this is the time for making up the roll. But in consequence of certain proceedings affecting our rights and privileges, proceedings which have been sanctioned by Her Majesty's Government and by the legislature of the country, and more especially in respect that there has been an infringement on the liberties of our Constitution, so that we could not now constitute this court without a violation of the terms of the union between church and state in this land, as now authoritatively de declared, I must pro protest against our proceeding further. The reasons that have led me to this conclusion are fully set forth in the document which I hold in my hand, and which, with permission of the House, I shall now proceed to read. He then read the protest. We, the undersigned ministers and elders, chosen as commissioners to the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland, indicted to meet this day, but precluded from holding the said assembly by reason of the circumstances hereinafter set forth, in consequence of which a free assembly of the Church of Scotland, in accordance with the laws and constitutions of the said church, cannot at this time be holden. Considering that the legislature by their rejection of the claim of right adopted by the last General Assembly of the said Church, and their refusal to give redress and protection against the jurisdiction assumed, and the coercion of late repeatedly attempted to be exercised over the courts of the Church in matters spiritual by the civil courts, have recognised and fixed the conditions of the Church establishment as henceforward to subsist in Scotland, to be such as these as have pronounced and declared by the said civil courts in their several recent decisions in regard to matters spiritual and ecclesiastical, whereby it has been held into alia, first, that the courts of the church by law established and members thereof are liable to be coerced by the civil courts in the exercise of their spiritual functions. Remember they've been told that if they didn't ordain the ungodly men to the pulpit, they could be sued and fined. Um, it could be liable um, to damages. Uh, a horrible implicate, a horrible intrusion by the, the state into the church, and in particular in the admission to the office of the holy ministry and the constitution of the past, pastoral relation, and that they are subject to be compelled to intrude ministers on reclaiming congregations in opposition to the fundamental principles of the church and their views of the word of God and to the liberties of Christ's people. Second, the said civil courts have power to interfere with and interdict the preaching of the gospel and administration of ordinances as authorised and enjoined by the church courts of the establishment. Third, that the said civil courts have power to suspend spiritual censures pronounced by the church courts of the establishment against ministers and probationers of the church and to interdict their execution as to spiritual effects functions and privileges. Fourth, that the said civil courts have power to reduce and set aside the sentences of the church courts of the establishment, deposing ministers from the office of the holy ministry, and depriving probationers of their license to preach the gospel, with reference to the spiritual status, functions and privileges of such ministers and probationers, restoring them to the spiritual office and status of which the church courts had deprived them. Fifth, that the said civil courts have power to determine on the right to sit as members of the supreme and other judic judicatories of the church by law established, and to issue interdicts against sitting and voting therein, irrespective of the judgment and determination of the said judicatories. Sixth, that the said civil courts have power to supersede the majority of a church court of the establishment, in regard to the exercise of its spiritual functions as a church court, and to authorise the minor minority to exercise the said functions in opposition to the court itself and to the superior judicata judicatories of the establishment. Seventh, the said civil courts have power to say processes of discipline pending before courts of the church by law established and to interdict such courts from proceeding therein. Now imagine you had a, a humble Baptist church somewhere in England, uh, an independent church, and every decision um, made by the elders could be overruled by the House of Commons or the Prime Minister or the House of Lords. Um, that, uh, that, that, that would be a horrible intrusion um, 
But here we have a whole country's churches um, where the civil courts have taken upon themselves the right to decide all matters of church discipline. Eighth, that no pastor of a congregation can be admitted into the church courts of the establishment and allowed to rule as well as to teach agreeably to the institution of the office by the head of the church, that's Jesus, nor to sit in any of the judicatories of the church, inferior or supreme, and that no additional provision can be made for the exercise of spiritual discipline among the members of the church, though not affecting any patrimonial interests and no alteration introduced in the state of pastoral superintendence and spiritual discipline in any parish without the sanction of a civil court. All which jurisdiction and power on the part of the said civil courts, severally above specified, Whatever proceeding may have given occasion to its exercise is, in our opinion, in itself inconsistent with Christian liberty and with the authority which the head of the church hath conferred on the church alone. And further considering that a general assembly, composed in accordance with the laws and fundamental principles of the church, in part of commissioners themselves, admitted without the sanction of the civil court, or chosen by presbyteries composed in part of members not having that sanction, cannot be constituted as an assembly of the establishment without disregarding the law and the legal conditions of the same as now fixed and declared. And further considering that such commissioners as aforesaid would, as members of an assembly of the establishment, be liable to be interdicted from exercising their functions and to be subjected to civil coercion at the instance of any individual having interest who might apply to the civil courts for that purpose. And considering further that civil coercion has already been in diverse instances applied for and used whereby certain commissioners returned to the assembly this day appointed to have been holden have been interdicted from claiming their seats and from sitting and voting therein, and certain presbyteries have been, by interdicts directed against their members, prevented from freely choosing commissioners to the said assembly, whereby the freedom of such assembly and the liberty of election thereto has been forcibly obstructed and taken away. And further considering that in these circumstances a free assembly of the Church of Scotland by law established cannot at this time be holden, so they weren't free to hold an assembly because any decision they made could have been overruled by the um, Parliament in England, um, cannot at this time be holden and that an assembly in accordance with the fundamental principles of the Church cannot be constituted in connection with the state without violating the conditions which was now since the rejection by the legislator of the church's claim of right be held to be the conditions of the establishment. After considering that, while heretofore, as members of church judica, judica, judicatories, ratified by law and recognised by the constitution of the kingdom, we held ourselves entitled and bound to exercise and maintain the jurisdiction vested in those judicatories with the sanction of the constitution. With that notwithstanding the decrees as to matters spiritual and ecclesiastical of the civil courts, because we could not see that the state had required submission thereto as a condition of the establishment, but on the contrary were satisfied that the state, by the acts of the Parliament of Scotland, forever and unalterably secured to this nation by the Treaty of Union, had repudiated, repudiated any power in the civil courts to pronounce such decrees, we are now constrained to acknowledge it to be the mind and will of the state, as recently declared, that such submission should and does form a condition of the establishment and of the possession of the benefits thereof, and that as we cannot, without committing what we believe to be sin, in opposition to God's law, so that they believed it to be sinful before God to go along with this, uh, just as I believe it's sinful before God to use transgender pronouns, um, different circumstances, same principle. In opposition to God's law, in disregard of the honour and authority of Christ's crown, and in violation of our own solemn vows, comply with this condition. We cannot in conscience continue connected with and retain the benefits of an establishment to which such condition is attached. Okay, that was long. 
um, and we're still going on here, they can't stay in. They can't. They have no option. They have no choice. Okay, so now we're getting to the crunch. <clears throat> I wish I'd been there. We, therefore, the ministers and elders, foresaid on this the first occasion since the rejection by the legislature of the church, claim, church's claim of right, when the commissioners chosen from throughout the bounds of the church to the general assembly, appointed to have been this day holden, are convened together, do protest that the conditions forced said, while we deem them contrary to and subversive of the settlement of church government effected at the revolution and solemnly guaranteed by the Act of Security and Treaty of Union, are also at variance with God's word in opposition to the doctrines and fundamental principles of the Church of Scotland, inconsistent with the freedom essential to the right constitution of the Church of Christ, amen, and incompatible with the government which he, that's Jesus, as the head of the church, have therein appointed distinct from the civil magistrate. And we further protest that any assembly constituted in submission to the conditions now declared to be law and under the civil coercion which has been brought to bear on the election of commissioners to the assembly this day appointed to have been holden and on the commissioners chosen thereto is not and shall not be deemed a lawful and free assembly of the Church of Scotland according to the original and fundamental principles thereof and that the claim, declaration and protest of the General Assembly which convened at Edinburgh in May 1842 as the act of a free and lawful assembly of the said church shall be holden as setting forth the true constitution of the said church and that the said claim along with the laws of the church now subsisting shall in no wise be affected by whatsoever acts and proceedings of any assembly constituted under the conditions now declared to be the law and in submission to the coercion now imposed on the, on the establishment. And finally, while firmly, firmly asserting the right and duty of the civil magistrate to maintain and support an establishment of religion in accordance with God's word and reserving to ourselves and our successors to strive by all lawful means as opportunity shall in God's good providence be offered to secure the performance of this duty agreeably to the scriptures and in implement of the statutes of the Kingdom of Scotland and the obligations of the Treaty of Union as understood by us and our ancestors but acknowledging that we do not hold ourselves at liberty to retain the benefits of the establishment while we cannot comply with the conditions now to be deemed thereto attached, we protest that in the circumstances in which we are placed, it is and shall be lawful for us and such other commissioners chosen to the assembly appointed to have been this day holden as may concur with us to withdraw to a separate place of meeting for the purpose of taking steps for ourselves and all who adhere to us, maintaining with us the confession of faith and standards of the Church of Scotland. Now, it doesn't matter um, what church you belong to. I mean, you could be brethren in Scotland, you could be Baptist, you could be um, uh, evangelical of um, some other flavour, congregational or something like that. But the point is this, that, that, that all of us in Scotland owed our liberty. When I was in Scotland, I was there for 17 years. Um, all of us in Scotland owed our liberty to this moment, um, and we can't get away from that. <laughs> this was a this was this was a um, this was a contending for the faith by many Christians, um, which opened up freedom for many Christians for many days to come. So there's no escaping that fact, um, and uh, the idea that we just have independent churches, but the his church history doesn't affect our existence as independent churches. Um, is 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 not is not correct. These people bought our freedom. They paid for it, and we need to remember that this was God working in their midst. For the so yes, we are to withdraw to a separate place of meeting for the purpose of taking steps for ourselves and all who adhere to us, maintaining with us the confession of faith and standards of the Church of Scotland, as heretofore understood 
for separating in an orderly way from the establishment, and thereupon adopting such measures as may be competent to us in humble dependence on God's grace and the aid of the Holy Spirit for the advancement of His glory, the extension of the gospel of our Lord and Saviour, and the administration of the affairs of Christ's house, according to His holy word. And we do now, for the purpose foresaid, withdraw accordingly, humbly and solemnly acknowledging the hand of the Lord in the things which have come upon us, because of our manifold sins, and the sins of this church and nation, but at the same time with an assured conviction that we are not responsible for any consequences that may follow from this our enforced separation from an establishment which we loved and prized, through interference with conscience, the dishonoured unto Christ's crown, and the rejection of his sole and supreme authority as king in his church. Amen. The reading of the protest was listened to in deep silence. When the moderator had finished, he left his chair, laid the document on the table of the assembly, and, bowing respectfully to the throne on which sat the representative of Her Majesty, gravely withdrew and left the church, minister after minister, elder after elder, all that was most eminent in the Church of Scotland for piety, for zeal and for talent, now calmly rose and followed the moder moderator. I believe the bo boners were there uh, in that train. What, what a stupendous moment in the history of the Church. Till all the benches occupied by the evangelical members to the left of the throne were entirely empty. The Lord High Commissioner, whose noble heart was full of affection for the Church of Scotland, his attendants and the whole of the moderate party gazed upon the spectacle with astonishment and fear. The government had been assured that there were not thirty, not even fifteen of the members of the Assembly who would leave the establishment, and now row was added to row, a hundred, two, three hundred, and yet more arose and departed. The spectators in the galleries filled with the deepest sympathy, could hardly suppress their deep-drawn sighs and enthusiastic cheers of admiration. The exodus of the Church of Scotland was accomplishing. The march of her leaders towards the door of the temple was advancing. An angel of God, though invisible, was moving before them. They had been required to rivet the chains forged by illegal resolutions. They burst forth those disgraceful fetters. They threw them at the foot of the throne, and poor but free, they left those walls wherein their fathers had so hardily fought in the cause of liberty, and which powerful men were attempting to change into a house of bondage. I agree. On the outside of the church, the crowd was in a state of eager expectation. The excited people were only separated by a wall from the important scene now transacting within and yet could know nothing of what was going on. Many thought that at the last hour some tardy measure of justice granted by the government would put an end to the difference. Others thought that at the decisive moment the hearts of the servants of the church would fail them, and that they would remain, as it were, nailed to their seats. Are they coming out, asked some. They will come, they will not come. Not seven will come out. Hardly were these words spoken when the door opened and the fathers of the Church of Scotland appeared before the multitude of their brethren. Here they come! Here they come! was shouted on all sides. The work was done. The Church is free. Our soul is escaped as a bird out of the snare of the fowler. The snare is broken and we are escaped. Psalm 34. Hands, hats and handkerchiefs were waving in the air. Not only in the street, the stairs, the doors, the windows, but even on the roofs of the houses, these signs of enthusiasm were exhibited. Wherever a foot could stand, wherever a hand could cling, was some son of Scotland and the church, saluting with acclamations her noble defenders. The whole people were in a state of unprecedented excitement, a shout, not loud and piercing, but a shout half suppressed by deep emotion, a shout proceeding from the depths of the heart resounded in the streets of the metropolis. The ministers and elders, forming a long procession and followed by a vast multitude, prepared to descend the hill to constitute a new assembly. But they were not alone in taking that direction. Deputations from the Presbyterian churches of America, Ireland and England, and from the Scottish seceders, had come, 
according to custom, to present to the Assembly their fraternal salutations. These deputations had to examine which of the two Assemblies represented the Church of Scotland. All of them, without hesitation, turned from the national pomp of St Andrews and followed the humble footsteps of the protesting Church. The Irish Presbyterians themselves, though supported by the English government, were not held back by the fear of seeing their regime dom un imperiled. Regime dom um, um. This is a witness from without which has never been retracted. We'll come to the Free Church in the next reading. This is a very important episode in church history. Uh, and the Free Church... Um, uh, like all churches, had her failings and uh, had her ups and downs. But uh, in 1987, I first um, visited the, the Outer Hebrides, uh, the island of Lewis, and um, that's where I first came across the Free Church myself, being Engl an Englishman, a medical student in Manchester at the time. And I attended the Free Church of Scotland in Stornoway, where um, a well-known minister, a mighty preacher of God's Word, Murdo Alec, ministered. Uh, Murdo Alec MacLeod ministered and the only thing I can say is that that church and that ministry did me good uh, we are reading uh, a book called Germany, England and Scotland uh, which was um, produced in 1847-1848 by J.H. Uh, Moldobigny, the famous historian of the Reformation a man from, a pastor from Geneva converted under the uh, Bible teaching on Romans by Robert Haldane. You can get the um, commentary on Romans by Haldane, still in pub print, I think. And anyway, we, we, we were looking at the disruption of the Church of Scotland and we read about the General Assembly where hundreds of people came out from the Church of Scotland and marched from one church to the other. A most important episode in church history, a most important time when the people of God were standing for the freedom of the church from state control. Um, believing and asserting quite rightly that Jesus Christ is the head of his own church. So I don't think any of us can really un uh, overestimate the value of the importance of the disruption. It's of relevance to us all, as I say, even if we were Baptists or um, brethren or whatever we were in Scotland today. Um, I'm no longer living in Scotland, but I was for some time. But um, we would owe our freedom to this event so this chapter, which might be the last, is sometimes hard to tell with a Kindle reading because um, I'm on 87% and sometimes it finishes at about 90 and there's lots of ads and things like that. Sometimes it goes on to the end. But um, this chapter, which uh, it deals with the events following the disruption, is called the Free Church, the Free Church of Scotland. Now, the Free Church of Scotland is a church that's done me good. I first came across them in 1987 and then again in 1989 and then again in 1997 onwards. Sadly, around 2000, there was a, a major split in the Free Church of Scotland um, at that time over some important issues. But when I first went to the Free Church of Scotland, they, was, they were still um, undivided. <coughs> and they did me much good. <coughs> and I thank God for them, even though I'm an English Reformed Baptist. The Free Church, the procession moved onward. It descended that long and spacious street which, from the heights of the new town, leads down to the valley wherein flows the water of Leith. The immense concourse that filled the street was so closely wedged together that it seemed impossible for the ministers to make way through it. There were neither policemen nor soldiers to force a passage, but another more powerful, more sublime agent, a feeling of respect, of admiration and of love, was at hand to move these masses. As if by an instantaneous impulse, the crowd opened on the right and on the left and formed in the middle of the street a long lane down which four ministers could walk abreast. And between these double rows of the sons and daughters of Caledonia, animated with the strongest emotion, with Welsh at the head, the only one arrayed in the Geneva gown, the venerable defenders of the independence of the Church of Christ walked calmly and steadily down the beautiful declivity on whose summit the state sat enthroned. The vast and plain hall of Tanfield, the cannon mills, in which two years afterwards I myself saw the General Assembly, had been prepared for the protesters, 
More than 3,000 Christians were awaiting them there. Welsh opened the meeting with a solemn prayer in which he gave thanks to God for the strength afforded by his spirit to his servants in the hour of trial. During this prayer, sobs were audible and the most manly faces were bathed in tears. When it ended, the whole multitude stood up to sing the praises of the Lord. The first hymn of the free church arose to heaven and the angel of the covenant offered it before the throne of God, Revelation 8.3. On the motion of Dr. Welsh, Dr. Chalmers was chosen by acclamation the first moderator of the Free Protesting Church of Scotland. Chalmers, in his opening speech, recalled the principles on which the step had then taken had been founded. The Assembly received as members all the ministers who had signed the protest, and an elder from each parish. Everything was then prepared for signing the deed of demission. This act was read in the Assembly on Wednesday, the 2nd of May. All other business was suspended, that every heart might be solemnly devoted to the Lord. The roll was then called. The ministers and elders arose by tens, moved to the platform behind the moderator's chair, and there, with steady hearts and hands, signed the act by which, for the cause of Christ, they renounced all their worldly goods and their position in society. Many of them sacrificed all they had, even all their living. The amount of the revenue was more than a hundred thousand pounds, which these brethren joyfully relinqu relinquished for the sake of him who has said, Every one that hath forsaken houses, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands for my name's sake, shall receive an hundredfold, and shall inherit everlasting life. Matthew nineteen twenty nine. Hundred thousand pounds, of course. A lot of money in 1843. No one swerved, young and old alike, traced with a determined hand the few strokes which signed away their all. The execution of this act occupied five hours, and during that time the assembly remained in silent emotion, watching with respect the devotedness of its leaders. 474 ministers resigned their benefices, either then or shortly afterwards. About 2,000 elders adhered to the act, both numbers united formed the majority of the office bearers of the church. The majority of the church members in full communion was also ranged on the side of, ranged on the side of liberty. Such was the disruption and the creation of the Free Church of Scotland. But the sacrifice then accomplished in the Hall of Tanfield was not the greatest was not the greatest. The ministers had to return to the mountains, to the plains, even to the remotest shores of Scotland, to bring their wives and children from their homes. There was, they paid a very heavy price for coming out of the Church of Scotland. One should not underestimate the price they paid or the suffering they endured. The hour was at hand when Jesus was to say in every manse, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Matthew sixteen twenty four. Hundreds in Scotland were then fulfilling this Christian duty and taking the cross upon their shoulders, were ready to exclaim, Lord, here am I. How many scenes were then enacted, enacting enough to break the hardest heart? In a certain part of the country, two ministers were conversing a short time before the disruption. Do you think there is no chance of a settlement, said the minister of the place to his friend. We are as certain of being out as that the sun will rise tomorrow, replied the other. A groan was heard. It came from the very heart of the mother of the family. They had had many trials in their day. There had been cradles and coffins in their home, and the place was endeared to the mother by many associations. There was not a flower or a shrub or a tree that was not dear to her. Some of them were planted by the hands of those who were in their graves. And that poor woman's heart was like to burst. But grace was mightier than nature, and when the day of trial arrived, she came forth as readily as her husband, although it was breaking her very heartstrings to leave a home where she had expected to breathe her last, and to be laid in the churchyard among the ashes <coughs> of her children. In another instance, there was a venerable mother in Christ who had gone to the place in the days of her youth when it was a wilderness, but who with her husband had turned it into an Eden. Her husband had died there, her son now was the minister. That venerable widow and mother, like Anna, the daughter of Emmanuel, 
had seen the snows and sorrows of eighty years accumulate upon her head, and like an aged tree which has fixed its roots deeply in the soil, she was attached to this home of her youth by the dearest affections. All her anxieties, her prayers to God, were for two things, either that the church should come to a right settlement with the state, or if that should fail, that then her son should do his duty. The disruption came, all was to be given up, and this venerable mother in Israel was the first to go forth. And she found in her new home, by the blessing of Christ, more health and happiness than she had enjoyed for a long time before. Some time ago a minister was walking by moonlight with another Mr Guthrie, who is restoring manses to the servants of God throughout Scotland. The two companions were passing before the beloved home <coughs> which the former of them had left for the cause of truth. No light shone from the house, and no smoke rose above the roof. Pointing to it in the moonlight, Mr Guthrie said, Oh, my friend, it was a noble thing to leave that house. Ah, yes, he replied, it was a noble thing, but for all that it was a bitter thing. I shall never forget the night I left that house till I am laid in the grave. When I saw my wife and children go forth in the gloaming, when I saw them for the last time leave our own door, and when in the dark I was left alone, with none but my God in that house, and when I had to take water and quench the fire on my own hearth, and put out the candle in my own house, and turn the key against myself and my wife and my little ones that night, God in his mercy grant that such a night I may never see again. It was a noble thing to leave the manse, and I bless God for the grace which was given to me, but for all that it was a cruel and bitter night to me. In another place in the Highlands, I'm feeling that because something similar happened to me. In another place in the Highlands, when the last evening had arrived, a poor minister placed his wife and children in a rough cart, and walking behind them, began to cross the mountains. A heavy snowstorm was then raging in that elevated spot. The mountain was white, although it was summer time, and the sky was dark. This poor family went on amidst the driving snow and cutting wind. We knew not where to find a place to dwell in, said the minister, but never did I know so much of the peace of God as I did that night. Thus I fulfilled the Saviour's precious promises. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The ministers thus obliged to leave their manses and their churches were not idle. On the first Sunday after the assembly, these faithful servants of the word of God were preaching everywhere, in halls, in barns, or in the fields, to great multitudes who listened with eagerness to their words. I would recommend the audio recording I've done um, of When the Church Has to Meet in the Open Air, which can be found on my page on the sermon audio when the church has to meet in the open air, which deals with some of the trials that these ministers went through preaching in the open air to vast congregations at that time. The prayers and discourses were filled with a renewed spirituality. The comforter himself taught his people. Never perhaps had the gospel been so powerfully proclaimed in Scotland to so many hearers hungering for the word of life. From Sabbath to Sabbath, nay, even from day to day, the faithful met together, the ministers preached, and Jesus Christ was glorified. How can we refuse a just tribute of admiration to the constitution and government of Britain, which thus protected in their full extent the liberties of the exiled ministers and of their congregations? Yet, alas, in many places the ill will of the landlords has taken the place of the ill will of the government, while the flag of modern freedom has been hoisted on the palace of Victoria, the old and faded colours of feudal despotism still hang, though tattered and drooping, over the ancient turrets of some lordly mansions. At Canonby, the free Christians, driven by the landlord from a wasteland where they had at first assembled, removed to the high road and turned it into a church. Imagine you were meeting on an A road or something like that. The only place that was public that they could meet was on the road. Of course, there weren't motor cars or lorries in those days, um, but um, this was a disgrace, and it became a national disgrace in the end, um, and led to a change in the law, um, allowing them to build churches. Um, where they had at first assembled, removed to the high road and turned it into a church. 
At one log head, the congregation consisting of 274 communicants met in a wild ravine. There's a wonderful picture of the one log head um, meeting in adverse weather. Um, if you go again to sermon audio, you look at documents attached to my page. There's one document which contains pictures of the disruption from um, hand-drawn pictures of the events surrounding the disruption, um, which um, is, is, is on my sermon audio page. Um, and uh, one of those pictures is of people going through intensely vile weather in order to worship God in a wild ravine at one lock head. Amid rugged mountains, 500 yards from the village, at Torquay in the island of Mull, a gravel pit served for a temple. At Dunghill, in which there were a thousand adherents of the Free Church, they met in a wood of Scotch firs situated in a hollow. And not only at the first, but up to this very hour, because it's only um, four years afterwards, or three years afterwards, seven, three, yeah, four years afterwards that he's um, writing this. Even during the last severe and tempestuous winter, women, children and aged men of the above-mentioned churches and many others besides have had no other shelter than the arch of heaven. Pray that your flight may not be in winter, said Jesus. Yet one season after another, the same distresses have afflicted our brethren, and that not under the mild sky of Palestine, but in the icy atmosphere of Caledonia, and the days are not yet shortened. In many places they preached on the sands of the shore, in the place left free by the retiring tide, and which belongs to no one but the ocean. For once, more kind and generous than man. In another place, in a deep gully, where the cliffs are some hundred feet high, a hollow has been closed in from the sea by a barrier of rocks down a precipice, where Claverhouse himself would not have sought his victims. And there, a minister with his congregation has raised his voice to heaven during two years. The waves of the Atlantic roaring around them have afforded them a shelter which their haughty landlords reclining softly in their London palaces, have dared to deny them. For the elect's sake, may the Lord shorten those days, Mark 13, verse 20. The ministers were often but little better lodged during the week than their flocks were at the hour of worship during the Lord's day. One minister and his family were so straitened for accommodation that when they would unite in their family devotions, they had not every room to kneel in their miserable dwelling, even room to kneel in their miserable dwelling, some ministers live in places as damp as cellars where a candle will not burn. One is obliged to sit all day with his greatcoat on. Another sees the curtains of his bed shake at night, like the sails of a ship in a storm. A third took refuge in a house open to every wind of heaven. On getting up one morning he wondered to find it more comfortable than usual, and looking up he discovered that a heavy shower of snow had fallen and stopped up all the crevices of the roof. The Lord thus makes the snow his minister to shelter his servants. Yet though the bush was burning, it was not consumed. Nec temen consumibata is the motto of the Free Church, and I think that probably means it was not consumed, and they use a picture of the burning bush. While these things were in progress, immense efforts were making by the evangelical people of Scotland True, it might be said, not many mighty, not many noble were among them. 1 Corinthians 1, 26. Farmers, artisans, shopkeepers and small proprietors, all of them living by labour and obliged to use great economy. These, with a few rich merchants and two or three noblemen, formed the Free Church of Scotland. Nevertheless, churches were built throughout the land with the assistance of some foreign brethren, particularly from America. And after a time, 600 of these pretty free churches which everywhere arrest the attention of a stranger in Scotland, always pleasing and yet modest in their aspect, arose as monuments of the freedom and piety of her people. During the first year, the contributions paid into the hands of the treasurer amounted to 418,000, well actually the figure here is um, 4,187,192. The total sum gathered during the first three years was 1,000,000, um, 1,470. So there we are. So the first one must have been uh, a wrong figure. We presume that's around 400,000. Besides considerable sums collected for local purposes, never perhaps was more mightily fulfilled these words of the Lord. Thou shalt have delight in the Almighty, and thou shalt have plenty of silver. Job 22 verse 23. And 
There is no end of thy treasures, Isaiah 2, verse 7. In the month of March last, the number of congregations and associations adhering to the Free Church amounted to 823. Not very many these days, though. That is a considerable increase, but there were 169 who had no minister. Happily, however, the number of divinity students at the Free College is sufficient speedily to suppress these um, vacancies. I think the Free College is a college has now been renamed. Free Church College has now been renamed the um, Theological Seminary of Edinburgh. Notwithstanding her own necessities, the Free Church does not confine herself to Scotland. She sends her missionaries to distant lands, to the heathen of the Ganges, to the Jews of Europe and of Palestine, and ministers to the numerous colonies of Britain. Nay, more, one of the, her first cares has been to fraternise with the evangelical churches of all countries, and we know with what generosity, notwithstanding her poverty and her own wants, she has stretched forth a helping hand towards the evangelisation of continental Europe. Here we stop giving thanks to the King of Sion for this work, which his wisdom and his love have accomplished in Scotland, and praying him to grant that the word of faith, of life and of liberty, which he has so abundantly shed, and which he has commissioned this church to diffuse over the world, may become one of those streams which issue out from under the threshold of the house of the Lord, and of which the Holy Spirit says that, All whithersoever the waters shall come shall live. Ezekiel uh, 57, 67, sorry, um, no, what am I saying, so I can't read that, um, it seems to say Ezekiel 157, but there aren't 157 chapters in Ezekiel, one day a few months since in the north of Scotland, a traveller was at the foot of Kenmore Ascent, near the Lake of Ascent, which stretches its waters for 14 miles among the most romantic mountains. The traveller was contemplating the castle of MacLeod, whose ancient walls rise close by the side of the lake. There, said he, is the place where the Marquis of Montrose, an old renegade and apostate, met uh, with a renegade's fate. He betrayed the cause of truth, and was himself betrayed into the hands of those who executed him in Edinburgh. But another building attracted his attention still more, the parish church, overshadowed by two trees which grew in the churchyard, and were the only ones he had seen in two or three days travelling. He asked some persons who were standing by how many people attended the church. The reply was, the minister attends, and his wife attends, and two or three servants, and the parochial schoolmaster. You do not mean to say that these are all, said he. Why, was the answer. There is not a body, not a body, not a body more. In fact, the whole congregation had joined the free church. The traveller then went into the churchyard, but there was no sign of a road into the church. It was all overgrown with grass. On looking through the window, he saw the seats and pews all covered with dust. Nowhere could he perceive the marks of human hands, except in the pulpit and the minister's seat. I saw it with my own eyes, said he. All this congregation had left the walls where their fathers worshipped, rather than not be steadfast in their struggles and their trials. Then the traveller, Mr. Guthrie, raising his eyes to the mountains that lifted up their lofty heads far above him, exclaimed, How vain is the expectation of our enemies! Never will they succeed in breaking down the free church. She will stand there as firm as her own naked mountains, and that powerful Lord, who is master of this country, from the one sea to the other, may as soon remove Kenmore Ascent as he will weaken the attachment of our people to our cause and our freedom. Well, alas, today the, the, the churches in Scotland, the evangelical churches and the gospel voice in Scotland is at a very, very low ebb. There is a remnant, but nothing more. We accept the omen. It is not the flock of ascent alone that stands firm as Kenmore. It is the whole free church of Scotland, the whole assembly and church of the firstborn spread over the wide world itself. Kenmore may tremble. The Alps themselves may quake. Remember that Tobinia was from um, Geneva. And our own Mont Blanc, removed by the mighty hand which one day shall shake both the heavens and the earth, may bow its colossal head and fall into our lake. Lake Geneva. 
The mountains shall depart, and the hills be removed, but my kindness shall not depart from thee, neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed, saith the Lord that hath mercy on thee. Those of us who are listening this, to this, who are Christians, who know Jesus Christ, know the mercy of God and the certainty of his covenant of grace. But if there are promises of God, man also has his duties. The Church of Scotland has lately given proofs of mighty energy, fidelity to her divine chief, fidelity to her forefathers and to her martyrs, unshaken faith. Christian life, ardent charity, unbounded generosity, incessant activity. Such is the example which a few humble sons of Scotland have lately set to the Christian world, and their example has already found imitators in our own country, in Bore. But watchfulness is never more necessary than on the day succeeding a victory. Amen. That's true. Absolutely. We all know what is meant by the recoil of artillery. The gun that is the heaviest charge and sends its bullet to the greatest distance is the piece that will recoil the most. A great forward movement is usually followed by one in a contrary direction. That is nothing, recently exclaimed a Frenchman eminent in the church. That is nothing, provided we imitate the artillerymen. Restore the cannons to their place and load and fire again. <coughs> Because sadly the free church is, is an absolutely shadow of what it was in 1843 today. And speaking of Scotland, we have already said, a revival is generally followed by a lethargy and a great elevation by a great fall. Much still remains to be done by the Christians of the free church. We desire to see all Scotland, that noble country, united as one heart to combat under the standard of Christ and of the fathers. Yes, we desire that with all our hearts. Scotland couldn't be further from that at the moment. But God can change everything in an instant. But this is not all. Oh, may God send a new Knox to Scotland or raise him up in their midst. The cause of liberty and purity and life of the church must make the tour of the globe and be everywhere established. Let us all then gather courage, perseverance and strength. Let there be no recoil and no shrinking back. That is the end of this book, which we've enjoyed. Thank God for J.H. Mildubinier, who wrote it. May the Lord have mercy upon Scotland in our day, and England, and Germany. <laughs>